In a few minutes, the webinar will start. Just a few minutes and the webinar will start.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to this new webinar from PWA. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Utopian founders and members for helping us to organize this shared event. Uh, for who doesn't know, Utopian is a no-profit, independent, and uh, inclusive observatory on democratic innovation. And we really need both democracy and innovation right now. So I strongly suggest you to go and see their website since they are promoting many interest projects. Uh, but uh, right now, let's start with the main topic of tonight. We have uh, four amazing women with us. So I thank them all for being here. And uh, I would like to start with the basic. What STEM stands for? It's very easy, probably. It means science, technology, engineering, and math. And we all know that these are all fields from education to careers where there is a big lack of women. But to really understand the scale of this phenomenon, I would ask to Flavia Marzano to share with us some figures. Flavia. Please, can you tell us more about it? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm very happy and proud to be here. Uh, let's just start from what I have in my background. It's a, it's a, a bit sad, but uh, I have to say that it's a seat taken, dedicated to all women victims of violence. And we want to reserve this seat for them. So one seat for them. So now let's switch to something more, let's say, light and uh, we will talk about um, yeah uh, women and stem um, i would say yes we stand <laughs> in the sense that so we have to we have to and that's our our main goal and this is a lesson learned from data on women and stem data is my the I, I, I like very much data and i think that we have to start from them before to take any kind of decision. And this is, uh, well, I'm, I'm uh, sick of acronyms and uh, that's one acronym, acronym for today, WISE. WISE Women in STEM Education. And I think that we really have to work on that. Um, I really prefer people saying, why not? Instead of people saying, hmm, yes, but. So I, like, I prefer to say that I'm a why not instead of a yes, butter. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, uh, nobody, nobody's perfect, as you know, and this is the keyword of my life and I'm working in uh, different places and my tags are open source, open data, smart land, equal opportunity, SDGs, SDGs, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, without, we would not be here today in this video conference. So it's the base of a uh, computer in the world. All women, don't forget that. But let's come back to data. And let's come back to data based on SDGs. Okay, so the, the fifth uh, goal is gender equality. And we should base all the policies in gender equality based on this issue. Uh, this is unfortunately uh, the information of, on DAISY, the, uh, the report on uh, technology in Europe. And you see Italy is not exactly in the best place there. Uh, it's still even wor worse than last year. Uh, and this is another terrific issue, I uh, three, uh, to uh, thinking about human uh, capital dimension. So talking about uh, internet user skills and advanced skill, we are the last in Europe. So we have to work on that. Right. This is a, a date on, uh, on, uh, on human capital indicator, female ICT specialist, as you see in Europe is not really very high. But this is a comparison, which is worse. So we don't have so many ICT specialists, but we do have less female ICT specialists. It's really 
easy to see. Looking at the graphs is easy to understand. And talking about doctoral degrees earned by women, as you see, uh, we're talking about the last 50 years. So the last three is just uh, a small data talking about, but engineering, computer, and physics, doctoral degrees are down there. Even in science, as you see, all the other science are better. So I think that we have to work on that. Proportion of women scientists and engineers in Europe. I show Italy where it is. Only 3% in the world, YCT graduates are women, only 3%. Only 35% of higher education students are working in STEM are women. 30% of scientific and technological researcher are women, one third and one fourth. If you look that on uh, uh, women in technology and it's really, it's really, it's really, really sad. I don't know how to say worse than that. And also these data, uh, you, can, you can see it by yourself. I don't have to explain it. It's, uh, just, just the image is very clear what we mean. And this is the worst information I have to give you. Age of six, girls already consider boys much better than them in activity, in smart activities. So we have to take our children since they are really, really young, less than six years, because they will never say stuff like that. But it's our fault. When we grow up, young boys and young girls, we have to teach them that there is not, it's not so serious, this kind of uh, information. And this is a uh, uh, percentage of female in uh, computer science. When, when I was in university in 1973, many, many years ago, uh, in computer science, as I said, uh, we were roughly 50-50. Uh, in 95, as you see, as, as you see is, it was 37%, and now is 18%. Why? Uh, I probably need a, a, a person, an expert in, well, maybe sociology. I don't have an answer to that. I mean, we need, the world needs much more person, expert in AI, in ICT, in, uh, in, in any kind of technologies, and the percentage of female is getting lower. Look at that. Uh, Data and artificial intelligence engineering and cloud computing. Look at the place of women there. 26% AI, 15 engineering and 12 cloud computing. Wow. And, and women are strongly underrepresented in the digital economy. Those are uh, other data. But I mean, uh, you can use these slides uh, if you want. So I just go on because I, I would like to maybe interact, interact much more with others. This is another terrific information uh, from the Global Gender Gap Report 2020. None of us, none of us will see gender parity in our lifetimes. Wow. And uh, gender parity will not be attained for 99.5 years. So we should work on that now, now, the future should start now. And well, sometimes I have the idea that could be the solution, but it's not the solution, of course. It's not a bomb, the solution. We, we are not uh, fighting, we are not making wars, we're doing something else. The other solution is that uh, this information, for instance, 60% uh, of primary school children will end up in jobs that do not exist yet. So now we could do something for them and make them, make women, uh, young girls now be able to be there in the future. So what we should do? We should stay, stay aware, awake, accepting, assumed, of course. And this is, uh, 
the synthesis of, of, uh, of what we really need. And uh, I don't have anything to add. This is uh, the UNESCO solution, the UNESCO proposal, change the perceptions, first of all, starting from young girls, as I said before, attitudes, behavior, social norms. We have to engage girls and young women in STEM in the beginning, in the school. So when I said, yes, we STEM, uh, I would like to say that we could be women empowerment in STEM. We have to work on that. Attraction, access and retention of women in STEM. Gender equality in career progression, progression of course, for scientists and engineers. Promote the gender dimension where? In research content, whatever. In all the agenda, in political agenda also. This must be uh, some political issue very strong. Talking about the uh, recovery fund, we have to put a lot of money to help women in being in the future, not just to stay home in the next uh, 200 years. Promote gender equality in STEM related policy making, then promote gender equality in science and technology based entrepreneurship and innovation activities. So I really believe that together, as tonight we are doing, together we can do it, together with all stakeholders. So the policymakers, uh, associations like uh, PWA or Utopian, uh, universities, enterprises, universities uh, and research centers, together we can do it. We should never, never give up and starting now, now is time to do it. Thank you very much indeed. And of you. course, I'm here for any question, if it is necessary. Thank you, Flavia. I think it's what you just said, it's astonishing. Um, on the other side, the reason why we are here tonight is first of all, to let the other aware of the scale of the problem we are yes. actually living and our children and nephews, whatever. But it's yes. also to give a message of hope because going through your slides, I took out a, a, a data. Uh, you said that only one out of five people, it's a girl. And um, if I'm here tonight, and if I call all of you to share your stories, it's also because I would like to share with you the results, the amazing results that some women can produce and can achieve. And that is why I really insisted with Agatha Quattrone to be here tonight and to share her personal path, because I think this could be an inspiration for all other women. Agatha, could you tell us more about your story and your path? Thank you, Gaia. Thank you also to PWA for this uh, well organizing and uh, meaningful conference. Just a minute, I try to connect uh, my screen. I hope you can see me now. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. My story begins in, uh, in southern Italy, in Reggio Calabria, a lovely and charming city, rich in history and uh, natural beauties. But uh, a city that uh, today suffers uh, a difficult span, given the weight of a 30 year debt inherited from a 10 year series of maladministration, culminating in a dissolution of the city council for uh, mafia infiltration, limited uh, employment prospect, the absence of private investors, limited accessibility due to the inadequate services and transport infrastructure and uh, uh, patriarchal culture. Young people, and especially young women who care about uh, their future and their dignity, find study one of the few opportunities for redemption for themselves and for their homeland. 
when uh, after five years of classical studies, I had to choose which uh, university to attend, I let myself be guided uh, by instinct and uh, the passion I always had for science, mathematics and technologies. No one in my family has followed this path before. I chose a STEM university. I studied civil engineering and a PhD in uh, transportation. And when I enrolled in the first year of my course on 200 freshmen, only 10 were women. Some dropped out after the first month of pre-courses. This is in perfect line with uh, data that Flavia showed has uh, before. I spent my days between lectures and study, spending time in the student lounge where I was the only girl. Over the years, we girl grew in numbers, but we remained always in a clear numerical minority. There was no shortage of ironic jokes from male colleagues about my limited abilities, even in college sports. I challenged them with derivatives, integral and set of table tennis and fantasy football. And I always had a smile as an answer, as you can see in the picture, which could be more explicit than a thousand words. I won over the prejudice of my colleagues, earning their respect and their affection. In the end, as stereotypes fell, I was one of them. The colleagues of my year proposed me for student representative on the engineering faculty board and was elected. I graduated in 2004 with a thesis on intelligent transport system for local public transport. And I continued my research activity in the university lab, majoring a PhD in transport and logistic engineering. The laboratory was a training ground for life. It was hard. The research activity was carried out seriously with national and international collaborations, and the results were recognized and published in scientific articles and presented in conferences of great importance in the scientific community. However, at the end of my studies, my hometown did not offer opportunities for growth and affirmation, even in the research field. Despite the delays accumulated by my city, it was not possible for me to give them a contribution to its growth, and the realities were difficult to accept. To accept. But the innovative scope of the topics dealt with and the experience gained in a growing sector as that of digital services for transport and mobility did not take long to open doors in the job market. Although I had always told myself that I would never leave my city, the, come, the time came for me too, like so many before me, to leave everything my family, my loved one, the friends of a lifetime, and my beloved sea, and follow the opportunities that present themselves to me away from the place where I had been raised and trained. Rome became my second home. On the departure from home, I remember I was terrified, convinced that I was vulnerable and enamored. But my STEM studies and research in the laboratory had trained me to hard work, team working and open confrontation, respecting deadlines, methodical organization in work, problem solving, computational thinking. Thanks to the STEM choice, I had the opportunity to work in an innovative reality in a very stimulating context collaborating with the main institution and big players in the field of transport and innovation. And despite uh, my initial fears, I became a, a useful and supportive element for the staff that was involved in the creation of the national digital platform for logistic and freight transport of the Italian Ministry of Transportation. 
Rome has been for me the playground of growth, of close confrontation in a highly competitive environment. It uh, was always easy and smooth. It often happened that I would felt uncomfortable in a meeting. It can still happen to me nowadays too, where the participants are mostly men in suites and there are a small number of women, most usually never in position of responsibility. It will have happened to each of us to receive an appreciation from a colleague, as polite as it could be, about the blues you wear or a new haircut, maybe with the best intention, as if this could help to make a tease in what would be an obviously male environment and relocate and rebalance the situation, restore the dignity of our role, relocate us in a dimension more suited to our nature. Then I learned that in order to gain the world and the space necessary to propose one's ideas and solution for the future, for the future, it is necessary to enter into the merits of the issues technically and competently tackle the issue under discussion, deepen and keep up today, stay on the frontier of innovation, use the tailored data and elements to overcome prejudice without being intimidated by the context, by an old cliche. My working activity suffered also on a barped stop after the the birth of my son Francesco. Upon returning from motherhood, the companies gives me the letter to inform me that my contract is not renewed. I find myself made redundant a summer's day with a home loan, a family, and a seven month old baby to grow up. Fortunately, my armor was thick, my curriculum was solid, and my sector as skill requested on the market. So I don't let myself go. In a short time, I get back on track. I start my activity as a project manager and consultant and take part in several digital transformation projects, always in the field of smart mobility. In 2014, an unexpected and a shocking phone call arrives for me and my family. I am offered the role of a councillor in my hometown with the responsibility for sustainable urban development, transport and innovation. A technical figure was needed with a woman to respect the gender quota in the council. A precious opportunity to make my contribution. Finally, a chance arrives to help my territory, to put my skills at the service of my city. I have no hesitation. I take the moment. My city needs me. I become a commuter from Rome to Reggio Calabria, 700 kilometers divide my roles of mother and wife and of local administrator. Thanks also to the strong support of my lovely family. It was a challenging experience which I have faced with an enthusiasm spurred on by the bundle's love for my hometown. The occasion was special to learn about public administration in a difficult context, refractory to change and to deepen every aspect of innovation. I made my honest contribution to the digital transformation of Reggio by coordinating a group of enthusiastic, capable people with whom we took up the challenge, which was firstly cultural. In just under two years, we were able to restart to the planning process, adopting the long awaited strategic plans of the city, the structural plan, the sustainable urban mobility plan, the informatization master plan. And uh, we obtained the, the the founding of a driver's metro and the intermodal parking for 1,000 cars. We have carried out projects in the field of energy and sustainable mobility using the funds of Pon Metro for the renewal of the local public transport fleet, the hybrid bike sharing system, the green regeneration of the city lighting system and public buildings. 
With the same funds, we have also carried out projects on the, the digital agenda, the open data platform, e-government services developed with open source software, including the one-stop shop for urban planning and uh, Segnaliamo Reggio Calabria, a digital platform that uh, gives citizens the opportunity to communicate these services to the competent municipal offices directly by an online platform. We have organized uh, moments of animation and discussion on the issues of su sustainability and innovation to involve citizens and stimulate them to discuss these new issues either driving, as a driving force for development, uh, in, particular, in particular in the innovation sector, Reggio Città Aperta, three-day event on the digital agenda with coding and professional training for young women the first city hackathon on open data, changing PR, a working day on the digital transformation of the pub public administration. I have faced difficulties related not only to gender, but also to the disparity of geographical rights. I still believe that I do not receive equal treatment proportionate to my competence and the experience which I have gained in terms of opposition and wages, but I am aware that I have earned on the field every result without shortcuts or help, and this is priceless. Without surrendering to a stereotype, I followed the path I wanted, without letting a backyard and conservative environment discourage me, I achieved the goals I had set. Without fear, I faced the challenges and seized the opportunities, and this allowed me to achieve something good for my community. A sign that it is essential not to step back and let a repulsive context awaken you, but to keep focus on the competence and certainty that comes from commitment, to overrule those conventions which set a limit to the fundamental role that women can play in order to introduce innovation and a more than ever necessary gentle digital transformation. For these reasons, I am convinced that women on, of the next gen EU can lead the road for innovation. In a recent uh, speech to the European Parliament, President von der Leyen explains that she has still impressed the image of Carola and Vittoria playing tennis among the rooftop of Liguria during uh, the COVID lockdown. She said, it's not just the talent of the girls that sticks out. It's the lesson behind it. No allowing obstacles staying in your way and always seize the moment. This is what Carola, Victoria, and all the young people of Europe teach us every day about life. So we women, don't let all convention hold us back. We have to take the moment to make our contribution to give a chance for the future of our Europe. I conclude, uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Agatha, thank you very much. I think, uh, first of all, you have an amazing path and it's worth really to, to hear it. But it, I was uh, really happy to hear you saying um, that all your success was reached now by, now, not but uh, through shortcuts, but through a curriculum that was solid. This was something that really kept my my attention because in Even the end my small contribution to instill the, the seed of change in uh, in different people uh, are today uh, committed and bring forward the projects that we planning uh, those years in those years and uh, this make me proud and hopeful for the future of course thank you yeah, and you talking about merit is something that really keep my attention and something we're gonna talk later uh, more with uh, Francesca, I think. And uh, 
Now, I would like to introduce to everyone, Luisa Scarcella. Luisa, you are one of those young women, uh, Flavia and Agatha referred before, who decided to be aware and who dare to combine something that is very special. So it's a human background, because you have a law degree, with more technical skills. Would you like to explain better what I'm talking about? Sure. First of all, thank you very much, Gaia, for the invitation. It's an amazing honor and pleasure to be here today. I was very moved by Agatha's story, so um, I tried to do my best um, and give you an overview of what my uh, path was like um, till now so far. Um, so I'll just share the screen now. Okay. It's charging a bit, but it should be working now. Okay, good. Um, so as you can see from the title of my presentation, uh, and as Guy already mentioned, I'm, I have a background in law, uh, but it turned out to, that I was very interested in new technologies as well. I was very fascinated by both subjects um, since I was a kid, actually. And um, during my PhD, I found a way to combine those two interests, but I would like to go a bit in depth on how these interests um, came alive. So when I was a kid, the first Christmas gift that I can remember asking my parents, so we're talking about 1996, was a desk. So our parents were very surprised. Um, and now thinking about it, I might, I might be surprised as well, but um, I really enjoyed this desk. I was spending there a lot of hours um, drawing and looking at pictures and uh, books. I loved books. Um, and I was very interested in general on understanding how our community works, how we live together, um, which are the rules that make sure that everybody um, can live together with the others and everybody feel well together. Um, and I thought like growing up that I could find some answers um, by studying the law. So studying the codes um, that have been ruling our society so far and our community and our economy and um, it's been uh, an amazing journey. I am very happy that I studied law um, back in college. And those five years were super interesting because I partially found some of the answers. Um, but right now, if I want to look at how um, society works, how our economy works, um, how can we can live together, of course, I need to look at new technologies as well because they're everywhere and they're influencing our society and economy um, as never before. So even if I uh, started to be interested in the traditional codes or what I would like to call traditional codes, um, I found out that in order to find the answers I was looking for, I needed to look at other types of codes. And, um, and so I decided to look at new technologies and um, going ranging from blockchain to artificial intelligence to um, well data science. I, I was like um, eating books and blog and everything I could find on the topics. Um, because um, as I said, as I mentioned before, during my PhD, I started to look at um, how in particular tax law, so my, my special, specialization is taxation, um, our tax law um, would play a role um, in when look at the digital economy. So um, looking at how new technologies can be used uh, by tax administration to prevent tax evasion, tax fraud, and how to guarantee at the same time a good level of um, protection of fundamental rights, such as privacy. Uh, but I was also looking at how uh, the digital economy um, could influence our economy and um, some people would be much uh, worse off. And um, so we need to look into and take into account the distributional effect and um, how the welfare state can cope uh, when um, new technologies challenges um, some of the, the economic parties and how the um, rules uh, that were governing our society and our economy so far should be transformed in order to keep up with the technological pace. So I also became aware that um, I could not learn everything on myself and by myself. So I need to ask for help. 
I think this was a main challenge at the beginning because um, you realize you don't have the, the skills because you, um, you're um, like having been approached these, these kind of issues from a different perspective. But you also realize that when you want to deal with the issues arising from the digital economy, you need to know the technology and the basics. Um, so uh, what I try to do is uh, while I was studying in Graz during my PhD, which I've done in, at the University of Graz in Austria, I um, start to um, contact people from other departments, uh, from the techn technological university, but also from my old university that were working um, in other in different faculties, so the engineering faculty or the uh, informatics faculty. And um, it turned out that they were very friendly people answering all my questions and uh, very happy to answer every kind of doubt that I had. And, and those um, discussions that we had together were extremely helpful um, to give me a solid um, understanding of the technologies I was dealing with. And um, I started to even um, code myself. So I started to um, get at, um, try to be more involved in the technological part of, of the studies I was doing. And, um, and I think what I was trying, like, um, trying to, to, I would like to convey today is basically that um, if there are people listening today uh, that don't have a, a STEM background and they're interested in the new technologies, you shouldn't be afraid um, to ask and, community, uh, com and communicate with other women or um, people experts working in the field, because it might be that really technology can be um, a really helpful um, tool in your work, or as in my case, um, you need to look at um, different research questions. So reach out. <laughs> and it's not a secret that um, well, um, you can be very good and an expert in your field, um, you always enrich your work and your research in my case um, while cooperating with others. And I have to say that I think it was mentioned both in the presentations uh, before me um, that um, I, I was lucky enough to cooperate and, and talk to um, some uh, female colleagues from the engineering faculty, but it's very true that there are still a few of them. And um, so most of the people that um, kind of helped me to get um, a bit of knowledge of the new technologies were mostly men. And I would be very happy to see other female colleagues um, help me out the next time. Um, so I think cooperation with other women or with experts from other uh, backgrounds is essential and it's a good way um, to get used to new challenges as well. On the other hand, I think what was the other challenge um, was to try to put some new glasses on and see things from a different perspective. Because um, of course, when you when you have like a certain background and you're used to look at questions and things that happen in your daily life from your own perspective, it's also good to um, adopt a different viewpoint and and start to look at things from from a different angle. And I think working with people um, from the technology and the STEM sector in general, it's very helpful to. Um, to see things differently. Um, even the methods that you use for your daily research approach or even um, the way they uh, deal with publications or conferences, it's very different. It's very interesting because you can improve yourself and your way of doing. But I think it's, it was also enriching for them to see another perspective. Um, because for example, a lot of people that are working on developing new technologies, um, are concerned about which will be the effects and the impact on, on society of, of these new uh, these new developments. Um, however, sometimes they um, have some issues in, in understanding how the, how the rules, uh, keeping it very general, the regulations, how it works, at what level um, there are competencies, so whether it is at European level, at national level, um, about intellectual property, that's another area of, of the law where they have a lot of questions normally. Um, even though I, I am not an expert in, in this field, I was um, very happy to introduce them to, to other people working in, in, in the faculty or uh, colleagues that have been working in intellectual property. So um, by looking at things from a different perspective from colleagues that you never imagined you would be working with, um, you can also then improve each other. Um, and so it, it really creates a, a nice, um, nice uh, circle of, of best practices and, and new things to learn. Um, 
And so that was basically my experience so far. I'm happy to answer any kind of questions. Um, uh, I've been starting in general in a new center, which is um, specifically dealing with um, taxation and new technologies. And um, what can I say is just one of my first questions during the interview was, um, how does it work with interdisciplinarity? Um, is, is there any um, colleague working from, uh, from other faculties that is involved in the center? And, and what I found very um, inspiring from, from that center is that they, they have, they have big corporations with other um, faculties. And I think that's the key to um, look at future challenges. Um, even if I don't have a background in, in STEM, um, I think for me, it's, um, it's a real uh, life goal to, to get more like knowledge on, on these topics. And I think cooperating and working with others is, is the key. Thank you, Luisa. Thank you very much. It was uh, really, really interesting. And uh, hearing uh, your story as well, I realized how really we do need to get and to gain a new perspective on problems. And this is why I think uh, as the end, it's, it would be wonderful to hear uh, the perception from Francesca uh, because uh, Francesca, she's a, an expert uh, of change management and digital innovation. And when I spoke with her, she shared with me a unique approach when talking about digital innovation and combining it with uh, the women and the gender problem. So Francesca, would you like to explain better what I introduced? Thank you, Guy, and thanks, Luisa, and all the other amazing women that came before me to share their perspective and their story, and I'll hopefully try to share my screen so that we can hear my story, basically, which can you see the screen. Is there might be some latency. So I was uh, at Google for 12 years and I was a humanist in a tech engineered male dominated world. And now I am a digital transformation advocate in learning innovation and people management. A smart worker long before COVID-19 forced everyone into it, a left-handed, that was forced into right-handed by my beloved dad. I'm a creative, multilingual, single mom of 10. My daughter is 10. And you could say I'm a digital nomad now because coming back from London, I decided to choose not Milan nor Rome, sorry. And I'm back to my hometown. And guess my daughter's best friend, who's she? My daughter's best friend is a Muslim black 12 years old girl afraid of her period because after that she will need to wear her veil mandatorily according to her and her family's belief. The other day my daughter happily introduced me to a new friend, Julia. He is 11 and declaring he does not want to be named Lorenzo anymore. Given all this, how much do you think from one to 10 do, am I worried about digital transformation, STEM, robots, AI? Uh, two, three, I think, yes, we are transforming continuously. And digital is a tool, a platform, an enabler, and an accelerator. I think it's a tool. And questioning why women or anyone else is important or relevant, it's like questioning the wheel, the fire, the steam, the internet, the email. We are all digital transformers. And at some point, just plain transformers. 
I think nowadays everyone, not just any leader, is confronted with the challenge of defining what is digital, what is STEM, what is digital transformation, and that, how does it apply to our lives, existing business models, different maturity stages, different markets, in such unpredictable time as those we're living today with this COVID thing. Instead, the focus to me should be that of defining the key mindsets that are needed to become a future leader, a digital transformer, a STEM, uh, an agent of change, call it whatever, in the present moment. So again, the future leaders uh, here is a boy, but honestly, it, it, it's a superhero because that's what we're talking about. We are talking about something that we cannot solve in our generation. It takes, like you saw the numbers, to uh, close the pay gender gap. It takes more than one generation. So it's a tough work for moms, for daughters, for uh, grandmoms and aunties, uh, uh, anything, honestly, because the digital leaders will be superheroes that will be able to thrive in this brave new world. And in time, they will become plain transformers for the rapidity of technological disruption. So the future will not be just about robots, about in STEM machine learning, the way we know it um, today. And I think that means like quantum physics as much as energy. And when I say energy, it's not just transportation, it's even personal um, energy and access to the wider universe if we want to go back to transport and to the unconscious mind. What, are, what is the bias we are having against ourselves? I was one of the first to take in the, the bias test and you guess what? I was biased against women. So women are forged into, into this. So I think there is a um, natural way of expanding the territory of possibilities for human transformation and what lays ahead for us as human beings, uh, irregardless of gender, religion, or whatever you stands for in life. So I think the key to become a continuous agent of change and disruptive context driven by technological, yes, innovation, lays an ability to be leading yourself and leading um, yourself in groups and leading teams, group of people. So to basically fully thrive in this ever-changing environment, it is essential to understand why is it that we cooperate as human beings? And now you see a picture is full of Hamish men. Yes, it is about the project, the purpose, and it is about making explicit what is it uh, that cooperation added to us and how we get good at it and how do we champions for the people um, that we have around. So I'd like to open the questions to uh, the panelists, to Gaia and all the people in the audience to actually um, understand with them how good are we, are you as cooperating with other people? And thanks. I hope we will be. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a, a very different perspective uh, from what we usually hear about the problem. And we have some questions that the audience uh, posed to us. Uh, but uh, before um, starting to read them, I would like, I would like to be a little bit provoked and ask something to Flavia and Francesca to see their different point of view. Um, which of you think that pink or gender quotas could be a solution to improve the actual situation? May I? So, um, uh, quota. <laughs> what are not exactly the best thing in the world, but is the the best thing to do we can do with something thing that we can do today. Uh, the, the day when uh, uh, people will uh, be chosen just by competences, at that day, 
we will not need any more quotas. Now we still need it because uh, uh, the power, power means uh, mayor or city council, as Agatha said, or director of a company, they are not always chosen by competencies and, and uh, capacity to do something. The day they will do, we will not need any more quotas. For the moment, we strongly need it. That's my opinion. Thank you. Wow. Uh, um, I don't think I have an opinion on quotas. I do have an opinion on the fact that it is a matter of having a uh, right balance of diversity when you're solving big problems to get the perspective of different people. So by applying the quota, maybe we try to solve the problem by putting women in CBA in um, in in the boardroom and it doesn't seem it it solved the problem so like albert einstein would say if you keep trying to solve the same problems with the same solutions maybe uh, again i would call for cooperation and say listen uh, girls and guys i it doesn't seem to work it, it is one thing that we can do and we have a multi parties um it's like a problem that needs to be tackled by different um, different solutions. So I would be open to experiment other stuff by keeping that because I think we need it. But if you observe the data and the curve, uh, it seems that even women in the boardroom have reduced the impact. And then you have all this amazing um, amount of data showing that when you have women in the boardroom, then these companies are growing. So it, it is doing something, but I, I, I think it is a too complex problem to be tackled just with that solution. So not sure uh, if I um, answered yes or no, but I don't think there's a yes or no. There's what else kind of um, answer to me. Okay. Thank you. And now we have a direct question, I think, for Luisa. Mm -hmm. And they say, as a woman in STEM world, I have heard so many nasty comments coming from men regarding the pin quota that actually discriminates men. Have you ever had such experience? And what is your personal view and recommendation regarding this topic? So um, personally, I uh, it's actually connected to the, the questions of, of that my other colleague and fellow panelists had answered before. Um, so personally, I never or like it never happened that someone um, kind of um, undermine my presence in a panel or in a research project because I was a woman. Uh, it does, however, um, bother me a bit sometimes uh, when I heard about it because it, it happens that you heard of, hear about this, this type of comments. Um, they didn't happen directly to me, but I know from friends. What happened to me is um, that sometimes um, I think I can understand that today um, quota might be an instrument. Um, but as a young um, person uh, starting to like attend conferences or like more in the past now, I, Maybe it's, it's, I am a bit acquainted too, but um, I was actually asking myself if I was there when I was the only woman in the panel, if I was there for a quota or because they have read my work, uh, like read my work. So, I mean, that's the opposite side of the metal. So when you want to be appreciated for your work and then you are the only woman there and you ask yourself, mm, I'm here for the quota or they are really interested in my, in my work. Um, that's that's one side. Um, the other um, the other um, type of comment that I would like to make, also uh, following up on, on Francesca, and on how to to solve also this this type of issue. I think it starts when you're when you're young. So even like in families, but in school, um, when there are some type of talk comments, um, we we should like not just uh, like um, give a smile or a little laugh. You should answer and. Yeah, just answer. And when you're like trained to do that when you're a kid, then you keep doing it your whole life. Like it happened to me that at a later on conference, just to be like super open, I don't know if 
openness can help in this case, but um, it happened that in a conference, like um, one told me, ah, we met at this other conference like one year ago, you were uh, wearing that dress that was that color, I don't remember now. Um, but, um, and my answer was, ah, really? So my presentation must have been very boring because if you can remember just the dress, it must have been very boring. Um, and so it became red in the face, like this very uncomfortable, uncomfortable situation. But I mean, it's really like um, you have to, to get the, the ready answer for, for this type of comments. And then maybe in the future they will stop, or maybe, I don't know, I'm very hopeful that and naive that you will not like um, make this type of comments for uh, the next female panelist that he encounters in, in his path, yeah. Okay, and uh, so now we have a direct question for Flavia. Um, and it's really, it's really uh, related to our city here, Rome, the capital, because uh, Luisa is asking, could you please advise on how to announce women's participation in decision making process in our city, Rome? Do you have any suggestion, Flavia? It's a very tricky question right now. Well, not just in Rome, I would say whatever, never give up. That's the answer. I mean, if you want to participate in, uh, in, in uh, taking decision, you have to be there and you don't have to give up. That's the only way. I understand very well uh, that, uh, well, it, it's not easy. It's not easy at all because uh, uh, we should force in some way people to listen to us. So decision-making process is, uh, is done by men and uh, we have to push them in, in the right direction. Uh, also now, I mean, not talking about Rome, but as I said, the, the government talking about the, uh, the recovery fund, uh, the recovery plan, we have to force them to put some money there. That's, uh, and to force means all together, all together, because there are women uh, with some idea, some other group of women with some others, we should, be all together. We have something in common. Just work on that. Not the differences. I mean, uh, you guys have for sure some different idea from me and Agatha, some others. We have something in common. We need to be listened and to be uh, to participate in the decision making process. We have to work together to do it. So that's what I suggest to any women since there's more. Yes, and hearing all your stories and your speeches, um, I just realized how much is important that we all realize how we need to ask for help. We need to help each other and not be ashamed yep. about asking exactly. it. If we don't know something or we think something is misunderstood, just maybe speaking louder could be a starting point. More than that, uh, very often we are saying, mm, I'm not so good in doing that. I'm not so keen on that. Men, they never do that. They never say that. I'm the best in the world, they say. So please, if you are able 10, don't say that you are able eight. You are able 10, say it and be convinced that you are. If you're not, other people will not do come in your direction. And I think there's a, I'm sorry if I pick this up, there's a big chance to, I mean, I had this um, person, a male I worked with and he said to me, Francesca, if you work for free, there's no reason people would pay you for your job. So there's a way of a cooperating with people and asking if I don't, if I'm not an engineer, I'm not a lawyer, and, but I'm very good at cooperating, as Louisa was mentioning, 
I mean, I raised my daughter in open sheer curiosity for everything and she can do a lot of stuff with that curiosity being able to ask, being able to ask for money, ask for cooperation, and of course, never underestimate what's in it and get yourself paid and do not work for less than you are worth. And that's painful sometimes. And I see a question in the chat about smart working and how it affected women, because yes, there was this pandemic and I was a smart worker before and people would question what I would be doing at home. And then in the COVID, everyone sort of uh, struggled with that because smart working doesn't mean you're not doing anything. But in some cases, we're not trained. We're not focused. So that affects our balance. That affects um, the way we work and our productivity. So to the question, is there any way to improve with smart working? It's yes, the company culture, the people you work with the trust that you uh, have for your the people you work with and then whenever people ask me when is it the best time to have this interview well that's morning my daughter thank goodness is at school and I can concentrate better than I would do in the evening so it, it is about being straight and forward and it's not easy but it's not easy for a lot of people, and it's not just about being a woman or being a man, young people cannot get paid enough. So I think there's a, a very um, good chance to cooperate, even to have that money from the uh, recovery fund, whatever the money will be, to use it and to take um, uh, I mean, to do, to be entrepreneurs, to, to do stuff. I know amazing women that they just don't come to this talk and they just do business and they're really super good at it. So I think it's, um, I mean, very pragmatic because I, I'm honestly, Gaia knows that I'm sort of um, <laughs> a, a true believer, but in some cases, uh, really blunt and I excuse if, Maybe I answered a few questions in the chat meanwhile as I was. It's good. It's, it's very, very good. good. Actually, I have been listening to all of you. And I think that my question to majority of the, the speakers is actually in a simple way, in a daily uh, life, how do you encourage and support other women to play an active role in a digital era? If it should be in digital era, uh, well, and now more than in digital era, I would say what I'm doing is uh, is mentoring, is coaching all the young women I'm in contact in any single uh, field, not just in digital. So if I'm say if I'm seeing a, a friend of mine or or a younger saying that, oh well, I'm not so sure that I will be a you must be much more convinced of yourself. So we need a coach. And that's what I'm doing to any single woman, uh, women I'm in contact. A bit um, gentle nudge to be forced in saying, yes, I'm able, I'm able to do it. I'm able to do it. I'm able to do it. I will succeed. Uh, and they don't teach us when we are so young. They teach us to say, mm, I'm not so good in doing that. This guy will be better than me. We have to work hardly, but uh, we will win for sure. Merit and hard work. I think they are a good solution for everything. <laughs> so I leave the the stage to Gurley, our president, to thank finalize the, the webinar. Yes, well, thank you so much. Um, I, I think now we kind of have a, a very good idea of what digital leaders look like. Um, disruptive, uh, very decisive, and um, I'm sure you've got a lot of the female friends who have supported you all the way. And um, it's so important to be very intentional and I guess uh, I'm sure Francesca knows pretty much about that because she she has a daughter, and I do have a daughter as well. And uh, I think whatever uh, path we choose in life, 
um, it's so important that we help each other. It, it's it's incredible uh, how much we could do uh, for ourselves and for the people around us. If we are, you know, we just express how passionate we are in in what we do. And I think this type of dialogue, this type of conversation, listening to this type of story really inspires us so much and maybe tomorrow we could do more and we could like what Flavia is saying and whoever you encounter um, in, in, in your life, whether most especially uh, women, you just tell them, yes, you can do it because she believes in herself and she transmits that energy to other women. And so for that, really, I thank each one of you um, Luisa, Francesca, Agatha, and Flavia for sharing your stories, uh, for sharing um, tips, actually. And I thank each one of the, uh, the members of PWA and our guests who participated tonight. Uh, it has been really thought-provoking and uh, inspiring. And um, I think um, it's never too late uh, to be a digital entrepreneur, it's never too late to pursue STEM, and it's never too late to be a digital leader, even if you don't have a STEM background. This is how I believed, and um, I hope uh, it encourages each one of you tonight. Feel free to send out your questions, and I would like to invite you on November 9th. We are going to have a speed dating networking connection with SheTech. So this is a, an, an important follow-up um, for this um, e-conference. And stay in touch. And uh, I hope this is not going to be the last time, and the first time and the last time we're going to come in to, to help to collaborate with, with Utopian. Thank you so much, Gaia, Christiana, and Marilla, and all the PW board who have been always playing creative um, solution to create a program like this. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you yes. to everyone. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Ciao. Grazie. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you all.